lot of our happiness and well-being in life comes from the quality of our connections with other people, both weak ties, you know, strangers and acquaintances, as well as deep ties, you know, uh, family and, and close friends, spouses, and so on. And yet, if you look out at the world, there are lots of opportunities for connecting with others that people don't seem to take, that would presumably improve both their own and another person's well-being, and yet they they don't do it. And I want to understand why they don't do that. That was Nick Epley from the University of Chicago, whose groundbreaking work on social relationships impact on well-being is the topic of our conversation today. Nick's research in this area is world-renowned. But Kurt, going back to that opening statement, I think the most surprising thing is this. While we know how important social interactions are to the quality of our life, we often don't connect with others when we have the opportunity to do so. That is so true. And it is the core of Nick's research, as well as our conversation today on this episode of Behavioral Groups, the podcast that explores stories, science, and secrets from the world's brightest thought leaders for the curious at heart. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. In our podcast, we talk about behavioral science insights that can improve your well-being and your relationships. And today's episode really epitomizes well-being and relationships. That is very true. Nick Epley is the John Templeton Keller Professor of Behavioral Science and Director of the Center for Decision Research at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He studies social cognition, how thinking people think about other thinking people. Say, no, that a, say that yeah, a couple times that's fast, a, that's right? A, that's a mouthful. How thinking people think about other thinking people. <sighs> and he studies that to understand why smart people so routinely misunderstand each other. It is a fascinating conversation that looks at why we are reluctant to share. The, the research that he's conducted to explore this phenomena, how our mindsets matter, and how we can get to a deeper and more meaningful conversation. And one deeper and more meaningful conversation that Tim and I would like to have is with you, our listeners. We want to know what is important to you. Understand what questions you would like us to explore. See what you want to dig deeper into on the conversations that we're having. In other words, we want to connect. And the best way to do that today is to connect with us on social media. You can follow our Behavioral Grooves Twitter account, which is at Behavioral Groove. That is Behavioral Grooves without the E or the S at the end. Okay, <laughs> And start a conversation with us. Comment on one of our posts. Tell us what you feel. What do you like? What don't you like? Just, just connect. Yeah, we would love to hear from you and start that conversation. And again, Twitter's great, as Tim mentioned, or reach out via Facebook. Instagram, LinkedIn, we have behavioral groove accounts on all of those. Most of those are spelled right. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> Whichever is easiest for you, just reach out. We uh, want to connect. Absolutely. And so with that, we invite you to sit down around a table, put this episode on a speaker and invite a friend or two or six or 10. <laughs> Maybe it's, they're just acquaintances and listen to this as you share a cool drink of social connectedness and enjoy our conversation with Nick Epley. Nick Epley, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate you having me here. We are excited to have you. This is going to be fun. And as always, we start with a speed round. All right. So, Nick, would you rather have dinner with your favorite musician or favorite athlete? Musician. Anyone come to mind? Uh, yeah, I, I, I have long been a fan of Metallica since I was a kid, and uh, I would... I would talk with the lead singer, singer of Metallica, James Hetfield. James. Oh, man. That would be an interesting he's, conversation. He's a smart yeah. guy. He I is a really smart, smart guy. guy. Been through a lot. Unbelievable longevity. Yeah. Totally fascinating character, I think. He spits just as well from the stage today as he did 30 years ago. I think it's amazing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Second question. Would you prefer coffee or tea? Coffee. That one didn't have quite as much. Uh, no <laughs> doubt on that. Um, yeah. No, I drink way too much coffee. No. Okay. All right. Who would win a football game between the Oles and the Carlton Knights? Oh, the Oles for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Particularly yeah, yeah. when you know when, when you were there, right? Yeah. Wasn't there? Yeah. For sure. Well, well, let's not talk about our record when I was there. But it was could have been better, but. Yeah, now not a contest. Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, last speed round question. When you first meet someone, are you more likely to engage in some small talk 
or try to have a deep and meaningful conversation. Deep and meaningful, for sure. <laughs> Excellent. I've and seen the data. You've seen the data, exactly, which is, of course, why we're talking to you. <laughs> which, which seems yeah. contrary to what most people right, think. So tell us a little bit more about that. So we've been working for about a decade or so now trying to understand what seems to me like a really basic social paradox. And that is that a lot of our happiness and well-being in life comes from the quality of our connections with other people, both weak ties, you know, strangers and acquaintances, as well as deep ties, you know, uh, family and, and close friends, spouses, and so on. And yet, if you look out at the world, there are lots of opportunities for connecting with others that people don't seem to take that would presumably improve both their own and another person's well-being, and yet they they don't do it. And I want to understand why they don't do that. And one of the things that we've really gotten our teeth into, which I think is a really general phenomena, we see it time and time and time again. This is a big hammer and I see, see nails just all over the place, is that people underestimate how positively these social engagements are going to go. So conversation is a good example of this. You and I, Kurt, get together to talk for, you know, first time. I would be happier, not crushingly so, but meaningfully so, if we had a, a deeper, meaningful conversation, if I actually really connected with you, if I learned some interesting things, than if we just engaged in idle chit chat. And yet, most of us are a little reluctant when we start a conversation with a stranger to go deeper, to ask something meaningful, to ask about somebody's kids or their favorite thing to do or an important value or a particular trauma they've had in life or some, these things that are meaningful that actually connect us to the mind of another person. People are often reluctant to ask about these things. And what we find in our work is that they seem to be overly reluctant to ask about them. So what is some of the reason why people are reluctant. I mean, it, it, you you talk about some of the different factors that go into um, why we kind of anticipate the types of interactions we get, but what are some of the reasons why we might be reluctant to go deeper in that yeah. first time? Yeah, so let me start a very broad level and then I'll zoom in the conversation. I think the general phenomena that cuts across a lot of different social interactions that we've studied, from having conversations with strangers to engaging in deeper conversations with strangers or, or acquaintances to expressing gratitude or giving people compliments or asking for help when you need it. I think the general phenomena going on across all of these situations is that we underestimate, we fail to appreciate just how social other people are. We tend to think about other people as individual agents who have their own interests and concerns and do their own things, when in fact, people are quite social. They care about others. They want to connect with others. When you reach out to someone, their behavior is not just a function of who they are. It's a function of the fact that you reach out to them. They tend to reach back. We tend to think about other people like marbles out in the world, I mean, you know, just these sort of independent agents with no connection to others, when in fact people are more like magnets. When they come into close proximity, the presence of one has some force that pulls the other often towards it. Not always, obviously we have some cases of repellent forces, but often they pull each other together. And thinking about other people as if they're marbles, when in fact they're magnets, I think produces a whole host of of suboptimal outcomes. Conversation is one of them. So what would it mean if I fail to appreciate just how social you are? Well, it would mean that I don't recognize how much you care about what I have to say in this conversation, right? So it would be really awkward if, Kurt, I ask you about, you know, tell me what you're most grateful for in life. I'd, lo I'd love to hear about it. Tell me about the most meaningful trip you've ever taken. Who's the person in your life that's most important to you? Why are they important to you? Um, if you assumed or that, that I didn't care about what you had to say, and I assume that you didn't care about talking about those meaningful things with me or hearing what I had to say on those important issues as well, well, then it would be a really awkward conversation. <laughs> I would be sharing all this meaningful stuff with you, and you wouldn't give two farts about what I had to say. 
And that would be unpleasant. But that's not how these interactions go. When I tell you, you know, who I'm most grateful for in my life, which is my wife without question, when I share this information with you, you're not indifferent to that. That kind of sharing causes you to share back, right? You, you, social behavior is reciprocal. Yeah. When I trust you with meaningful information, you trust me back and share meaningful information. Well, and then that's how friendships work, right? But failing to appreciate that kind of magnetic feature of interaction, that you get this kind of reciprocity, reaching out to another person means they tend to reach back to you in a positive way, means that we underestimate how positive these interactions are going to go, and therefore I think are overly reluctant to have them. So we'll stick with idle chit-chat, which we kind of all dislike at some level, when we could do better. But yet we're still we're still tripping over our, our we're stubbing our toes constantly on this. This yep. this absolutely yep. fascinates me yep. and I remember being a young business person in my early 20s having a job where I got on airplanes and traveled and and very frequently I would have some business work to do but Somebody sitting next to me might engage me in a conversation, and it was always interesting. But I go back to the office, and everybody in the office would be downplaying. Oh God, I get on the plane and just want to work. Just stop talking to me, you know. So I kind of adopted this. Well, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it's maybe I'm missing like the bold point of stop talking to people on airplanes. But I I still like it. I yeah. still liked it. I would argue that your colleagues are missing something, mm. and <laughs> right. and so the world. There, there are lots of ways to learn about the world. As scientists, you know, we run experiments, we collect data from people in different conditions, and we learn the outcomes from people in different circumstances. So I can see, Tim, how much you would enjoy that conversation on a plane if you talk to the person next to you versus if you didn't, right? So that's what we can do in experiments. Daily life doesn't allow us that. Daily life often gives us selected outcomes. So, Tim, you chose to talk to this person on the plane and you learned something, but your colleagues maybe didn't talk to that person and they didn't have a chance to learn what that situation would have been like if they had done something else. So the world is is what my former, uh, well, our ex-University of Chicago faculty member at, at, at Booth, Robin Hogarth, refers to as a wicked environment. It's mm. a wicked learning environment where the feedback we get is asymmetric. It doesn't have high fidelity like it does in experiments where we can learn from different outcomes. We only learn from the one we chose and not from the ones we avoided. And beliefs that encourage social avoidance. I think it would be unpleasant to talk to you, Tim, so I don't. Kurt, I don't think you want to have a deep conversation with me, so I stick to the shallow end of the of the conversation pool. Yeah. And in that case, we you would own... have been right, by the way, of course, with Kurt. I'm just, <laughs> just going to say that. So. We, we only learn from the things we do, not from the things we don't do. And so beliefs that are avoidance-oriented, that keep us from doing things, are also the ones that are likely to be the most miscalibrated because we don't learn from experiences we don't have. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned, the, by the way, two of the, in, in your un, uh, under sociability article, you talk about three things. You talked about the asymmetric learning and the, this uh, differential construal of sociality, but you also talked about uncertain responsiveness um, and this, this, this concern. Um, how did you come to these three? How did you like boil all of this down with, as you said, a decade worth of data, Nick, you've been, this isn't like you just started researching this last night. <laughs> you know, you, right. This is, this is, this is a passion. How did, right. how did, how did you boil these down to these three things? So there are different ways that behavioral scientists do their work, work different approaches we take. And if you take one, you tend to be condescending of others, <laughs> um, which is a sort of, unfortunate feature of the human condition. But as you get older, you recognize there's value in lots of different approaches. And so one way to do research is to start with a set of basic principles, basic psychological mechanisms. You know, we're not very sensitive, in, uh, for instance, to 
to the noise that's in our judgments. We're not aware of error in our judgment. Okay, and, and that then leads to a bunch of different effects. You can use that basic principle to predict a bunch of different outcomes out in the world. And sometimes sometimes we do that. Uh, other, other researchers do this as a matter, of course, in the kind of work they do. The other approach is to do more backward induction, which is to look out in the world out there and notice something that just makes you go, hmm, you just, hmm, why does that thing happen? And this whole body of research that I'm talking about here is of that latter category for me. I, I so vividly remember one day on my train ride into Chicago, having this overwhelming aha sort of moment. I was writing my first book titled Mindwise, where I was describing this amazing feature we have as human beings to think about the minds of others. I think it's something that really makes us unique on this planet. Much of our brains are dedicated to social cognition uh, and this capacity to connect with the minds of others is critical for our happiness and our health and well-being. And yet on my train ride every morning into the University of Chicago for uh, you know the better part of nine, well, this was probably seven or so years at that time I was doing this, I saw the same thing day after day after day. Highly sociable people with brains uniquely equipped to connect with the minds of others who weren't doing it ever, like ever. You'd sit on the train. People would line up along the windows as if they were hugging, you know, some sort of protective <laughs> space. God forbid you'd sit next to another person. They had to, and then people would get on the train and, and they would creep in next to you always last to me. Like I was always the guy who had the one seat next to him. <laughs> Somebody would at the end, they would be stuck sitting next to me. They would sit next to me. And then 45 minutes, we would go on the train ride, sitting cheek to jowl with someone who was social like us, made happier and healthier by connecting one of our neighbors, not a random psychopath. <laughs> and what would we do for 45 minutes? Nothing. <laughs> totally ignore each other. Like, what the hell is going on? Why do people do that? So th that was the, and it's not like, you know, it's not like I hadn't done this for years. I had, but one of the things you do as a, one of the things you do as a, a researcher, I think, is that you get your antenna, antenna tuned to these kinds of observations and they strike you as, oh, why are we doing this? And so I had this insight one morning on the train. Why are we doing this? <laughs> That's what started all of this. I actually had a conversation on that very morning with a woman I remember very well. She's wearing a red hat, older African-American woman carrying this big bag. And I thought, well, this seems dumb. What if we tried something else? And so then I tried something else. I had a lovely conversation with her for half an hour. And so, so that's what started these wheels turning. I study social cognition for a living. I study mistakes we make in these mental state inferences. So it's not like this was a new topic for me, but trying to explain why do we do this was like grabbing the loose thread on a sweater. Once I tugged it, mm -hmm. oh yeah, all of this stuff started to unravel out of it. And then Tim, back to your initial question, you try to explain it. This is what we do as psychologists. Well, why why would we be reluctant to engage with a stranger when, in fact, it turns out pretty well? What could explain that? So at that point, you're consulting the literature. And I didn't come up with anything new here in terms of why people are reluctant to do this. What I did was I connected our knowledge. I worked backwards from the other approach to doing research. Yeah. I took this phenomena. I tried to think about why this might be not just random, but systematic. And based on what I knew of the literature, was able to identify what I thought were a few plausible mechanisms. And I started testing those with my collaborators. And we found evidence for some of them. Um, and, and that's how it worked. And I'm sure, look, I'm, sh I'm sure there are other mechanisms at work here, Tim, other things beyond these three that we've identified. I don't know what those are. We'll find out. Yeah. So two questions here, totally unrelated to each other. So uh, let's let's go with the first. Given what you just said, so you, you got this epiphany, you're you're on the train, you're you're looking at all of this, and then 
So what has been some of the research that you have done to kind of highlight this, to kind of get at some of these understandings of different pieces? Is there one or two research elements that you could uh, explain with our with our listeners to kind of highlight what what some of that research is that you've yep. been doing to do this? Second part of the question then comes after this, going back to what you talked about, about moving from the, the like that kind of just small talk into deeper talk. And we talked about the reciprocity of this. And I'll come back to this because these are two very disparate questions. And I apologize. This idea that, okay. all right, so in that case, do you do you start by asking people uh, those deeper questions or do you start by sharing about yourself in those deeper questions because again if it's a, re a reciprocal type of relationship um you would I, I would assume that you would start by sharing about yourself but that kind of seems different than how what anyway we'll we'll start with the first one tell us about some good research and then and then we'll, we'll come back yeah. to this other whole different line as, as we go on yeah so the research that started this whole program about what we now refer to as under sociality we just started on the train I was on, and we simply turned that into a legitimate experiment. You, When you notice something yourself, you do want to understand, is this just me? Am I weird? Right? Am I unusual? That's why we run the experiments, to find out whether effects are general and robust, or whether they're unique to a particular person or, or group. And so one of the first experiments we did just went to the train that I ride on. We went to a station just north of us in Homewood, Illinois. We went down into the lower level before people go up on the trains. And in the morning commute, we recruited people for a commuter survey, a commuter study. If they were interested in participating in that experiment, we then uh, randomly assign them. And this is important. They agreed to participate before we randomly assign them con to conditions. So we're not telling them what they're going to do and then allowing them to choose, right? You're either in the drug treatment condition or you're in the placebo condition. Decide which one do you want to do this? Yeah, right. They signed up for the experiment and then they learned what they were going to do. And we asked them to do one of three things. We asked them to either uh, do whatever they normally do on the train that morning on the way in to that's one condition. That's our control condition. We asked them in the second, uh, another condition to just enjoy your solitude on the way in this morning. Just keep to yourself, just focus on your day ahead. That's our solitude condition. And in the third condition, we ask them to do something radical, which is, you know, when a person comes and sit down next to you, try to have a conversation with them, try to make a connection with this person. We then handed them an envelope that had a survey in it. Uh, that's our old school way, an actual paper survey <laughs> that they filled out and dropped Crazy. back in the mail. I know it. This was you a didn't decade have an ago we did this. <laughs> yeah. We didn't at the time or, or we didn't know how to use it. I can't quite remember, but we actually had, you know, envelopes with stamps on them and they filled out a, the pulled out, pulled out the survey and filled it out at the end. They also gave them a $5 Starbucks gift card for doing that, which is the most valuable incentive you can give to anybody <laughs> on the planet, as far as we understand. Especially, and com especially commuters. <laughs> yes. Especially commuters in the morning. Yeah. If we'd actually given them a cup of hot uh, coffee, that probably would have been better. But anyway, that's what we did. Um, and then at the end, we just asked them to pull out the survey and fill it out and drop it in the mail and send it back to us. The survey asked them uh, about a, a bunch of things. The first four things were the things we were or are testing our primary hypotheses. We asked them how productive were you on your commute this morning compared to normal, much less productive or to much more productive. Turns out we didn't find any differences across conditions on this. Huh. Um, so to Tim's point earlier about the colleagues saying you got to work on the plane, uh, at least on the train, people didn't seem to get much done anyway uh, on the train. <laughs> or at least once you asked them to have a conversation, they found that to be pretty productive. Yeah. We don't know. Um, and then we also asked them about just how good was the commute. We asked them about their mood. How sad are you now compared to normal? How happy are you now compared to normal? Um, or sorry, we asked them how sad they are uh, after the commute and how happy they are, not compared to normal. But then we asked them how pleasant was your commute to, compared to normal? We averaged those three together, reverse scored the negative item just to get a measure of, well, how, how positive was your experience? And what we found was that those in the connection condition reported a more positive experience than those in the control condition or the solitude condition. And so 
that then raised the question of, you know, hmm, why? It's rare that people choose to make themselves less happy than they <laughs> could be, or at least people think that it, it's not usual for them to do this. And we thought that people, uh, to, to our earlier point we were talking about, we thought that people might, um, might have mistaken expectations about how these social interactions would go. And that they were then behaving perfectly rationally, that is aligned with their expectations, but that their expectations about their commute might just be wrong. That is, we, for a variety of reasons, expected that people might think that they would enjoy their commute less than they actually would if they engaged in conversation than if they kept to themselves or did whatever they normally did. So to test whether people's expectations might be calibrated or miscalibrated. We ran another experiment recruiting people from the same station, same time of day, but this time asking them to tell us how they thought they would feel mm. if they were in each of these conditions. And these participants reported telling us or, or reported thinking that they would actually be the least happy have the least positive commute in the connection condition mm. than in the control condition or in the solitude condition. Gary Becker, who is one of our famous Nobel laureates in economics at University of Chicago, in his Nobel address noted that the rational choice model, that is the rational uh, agent model, which is dominant in, in economics, assumes people are rational agents, assumes that people behave in the world in a way that maximizes their well-being as they conceive it. And that conception part is appropriate. Rational agents behave in line with their expectations. It doesn't mean that their expectations are aligned with reality. And so what we found was that people's expectations here were miscalibrated. And again, that was the first kind of tug on the loose thread on a sweater that everything else started to to stem from, we found those miscalibrated expectations were, were quite common about interaction. They stemmed, at least in this case, again, from thinking that others aren't that social. What we found was that people thought they were more interested in talking to others than others were in talking to them. And if you didn't think other people didn't want to, if you thought other people didn't really want to talk to you, well, it'd be impolite and rude to try to engage them in conversation. But it turns out when you say hello to somebody, I love your hat, I have one just like it which was what I said to the woman who sat down next to me that morning on the train. <laughs> well, they're going to do just what you did, Kurt. They're going to laugh. And that's going to then start uh, an interaction that wouldn't have had otherwise without it. So that's an example of a kind of experiment we do. We've replicated that recently, more recently, and uh, in trains coming in and out of London. Uh, there we also find that um, what people are reluctant about there is is not having a conversation. It's not that they think that if they have a conversation, it'll be unpleasant. They actually think it will be pleasant if they have a conversation. What they think is that starting one is going to be hard because mm -hmm. they think other people don't want to talk to them. And so there, if we ask people to imagine trying to have a conversation on your commute that morning, people thought that wouldn't be very pleasant compared to the other things you might do. But they thought that if they actually found somebody they wanted to talk with, that is actually having a conversation they thought would be pleasant with more pleasant than keeping to themselves. So that's an example of the kind of research we do here. We've expanded this. We've done this now in lots of different domains. We've looked at once people are talking, what happens when you engage in relatively more versus less intimate conversation? That's the deep talk question you'd asked about earlier. We've looked at what happens when people reach out and express gratitude to somebody they they feel grateful to or express a compliment to somebody or do a random act of kindness for somebody else or or ask somebody for, for help when they're in need. And just over and over and over again, reach out and express to support to somebody, engage in a constructive conversation. I mean, it's, I, I feel like we're our papers are sort of broken records, but it, <laughs> the, the effects are so, so robust that people are just not social enough for their own well-being. And we find this time and time again. Going to the second question then, as you're thinking about that, as you talk about that deeper, deeper meaning, and maybe this isn't part of this, but, but do you start that deeper conversation by sharing about yourself or is it by asking the question of somebody else? Did any kind of insights as to, so if I'm going to do this, how is the best way of being able to do it? So that's a great, 
That is a great question. And I want to answer it in two ways. <laughs> so first, I'll say we don't really know. Mm. So we haven't, we haven't tried to optimize this. And I'm sure it matters a little bit. I'm sure it matters a little bit. And this is something we get questions about all the time. Okay. All right, Smarty Pants. So I'm going to do this. How do I do it? Yeah. How do I start a conversation? Right? But I actually think that's the wrong question to ask. Yeah. I don't think that's the right way to think about this. I don't think that people have difficulty knowing how to do this. They have some. And, and that's not to say it's not important. It is important. I think the bigger issue is that people don't try and that it's not, I can give you a list of tips on how to start a conversation, open with a compliment. I think actually starting by, by showing interest in another person, I can give you some tips. I think that's sort of marginal. I think those are sort of small things. I think the bigger thing is people don't choose to put themselves in this, these situations and then use the skills that they already have to make these things work. I think a more productive approach to a lot of these things in, in social life is just to change the way you approach other people in your daily life. If you were just more open to engaging, if you just yourself took more of an interest in other people, recognizing it'd be good for you and them as well, you would do a lot of the things just automatically that you already know how to do to make things better. So for instance, this morning we had snow here in Chicago. I have a little tractor that's got a plow on it. My kids love to ride on my lap. My youngest is six. She, she's little. She loves to ride on my lap. All my kids have. I have five. They've all loved to do this. And when we drive along on the tractor, we, we make a point of watching folks who come by us and we wave. Mm. We wave to them. And that act of waving makes that it's just so much more fun. <laughs> Other people engage with us. They smile to us. They think it's fun. They're waving. You know, Lindsay, my daughter, is waving. And so just that little thing, if you take an interest, you pay attention to other people, you start just automatically doing things that make it easier to connect with them. In conversation, you sit down next to somebody, you take an interest in them. What do you do? Well, good morning. How are you doing today? Hey, I love your hat. Jeez, that's a big bag. Are you moving out of the house this morning? <laughs> right? You, you would do you would do a lot of the things that are appropriate for the context that you are in, and then a lot of these other things would would flow more naturally, I think. Um, but to answer your question about do you start first sharing something with yourself or wait for somebody else to share? I, I think you don't quite do either. What you do is you take an interest in another person. And you ask questions that make it clear that you, you care about them in some way. And that will then naturally start to kind of thaw whatever ice was b between you and, and make it clear to the other person that you, you just are genuinely interested in what they have to say and that you're willing to share. And that, you know, escalates the reciprocity and you end up having a nice, nice conversation with somebody. You talked about compliments, Nick, and one of the things one of the papers that uh, I love that you wrote was uh, a study with some MBA students about having them to basically be complimentary to someone. And uh, that it's kind of, it seems like it led you down a path to, to make a claim that you, you can't compliment someone too much. Is that, is, is that an overstatement? I might be overstating. I it. think that's, that's probably an overstatement. I okay. think the right way to describe this work. So we've got a few, we've got a, a few projects or a few results that are in this ballpark. One involves expressing gratitude to somebody. Those tend to be people you know well. Those are really deep and meaningful things that compliment somebody else on, on something really deep and meaningful that they've done for you. That, that's kind of turned up to 11 mm. on that social interaction. Compliments, though, can be just anything that that comes to mind. Hey, I like your hat, or uh, I like that poster uh, on your wall behind you, you uh, Tim. You know, a compliment that comes comes to mind that can be rather seemingly rather small, or maybe not of so much consequence. I think what our research tells us is not not that you should be social all the time, not that you should always be talking to strangers, always be engaging in deep conversations, always be giving people compliments on and on and on. What we've identified, I think, is an important point of friction in social life. Cases where would maybe want to reach out and engage with somebody, but eh, you're a little nervous about doing that. 
these approach avoidance conflicts are all over in daily life. And it's those places, those places where you're, you're conflicted. Now, should I say hello to this person? Should I give this person this compliment that came to mind? Everybody uh, has somebody they feel grateful to who they haven't, they'd like to tell them, but they haven't figured out quite how to do it yet. Those are the places where being off a little bit on the cost of reaching out and engaging or, or underestimating how positively these are going to go that are going to cause us to maze, make unwise choices that you would regret. So if we if we ask the question, should I or shouldn't I, we've already answered the question. The answer is just go ahead and do it. Go ahead and make I the think, compliment. Well, yeah, so exactly. If you are having that dialogue with yourself, should I do this or not, you should do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If it's clear to you, this is a psychopath, <laughs> right, or this is a dangerous situation, or nothing positive at all is coming to my mind about this person, Right. If you're purely in the avoidance category in this situation, our data don't suggest that you should ignore that. Right. Like, you know, uh, you know, our our data don't suggest that you should get into the car of a stranger who comes by and invites you in the car. Right. That's not what they suggest. What our data suggests is that when you're in this mode, when you're conflicted, you're probably getting the cost wrong. Mm. That avoidance calculus is probably off a bit. And if you were aware of that, I think you would make a different choice in these situations. So I'm not wildly social. I'm not that guy on the plane that talks your ear off to death. But, you know, when I get a sense that, you know, this person would be interested in talking or I, or I know they'd be interested if I, if I started and I'm able to, they seem able to, I'll start it. But, I, but not, not all the time. So there is a happy medium. Oh, I was. I love uh, your willingness to sort of admit to the epiphany on the train as kind of a me search kind of a thing, and I, I think mm-hmm. that that I, I I don't know. I just on a personal level, I think it's really great that people who are doing the kind of work that you're doing are paying attention to the world in a way that says, "Wait, I'm affected by this. Maybe somebody else is," and and I think. Yeah. And we and we get inspired by that, you know, uh, because uh, we're practitioners, right? We don't have the we don't have um, a phalanx of grad students at our disposable, you know, to uh, to get research done. Mm-hmm. So we're we are grateful that that you you take time and energy to observe the world, ask a question, and then try to solve this problem of why do we do what we do. So um, yeah. Uh, there really wasn't a question there, but I do. <laughs> but I, well, it's a compliment. Say, Tim is giving you a yeah, compliment. I appreciate that right very there. much, Tim. He's thank you. He's applying this as, as we're Thank we're you. This. I appreciate that very much. One of the things I say to my my MBA students every year when, I, when, when I'm teaching is, is that everyone in their daily lives is a behavioral scientist. Yeah. Everyone. Everybody does this. Love that. Right? And we all have beliefs and causal theories and – uh, about why people do what they do. I, I mean, I'm in these conversations all the time. I'll tell people about the research I'm doing and then just wait for them to tell me why people do this, right? <laughs> Everybody's an expert in this. I don't think this happens to physicists or neuroscientists, but it happens to me all the time. And the difference between what we do as behavioral scientists and what we all do as intuitive scientists is that we subject our observations to a higher level of scrutiny, ideally, that allows us to see things that everyday experience doesn't always give us. We see all of the observations that we could across a wider range of people measuring outcomes carefully and tracking them over time rather than just using our memory for events. So it's not a a difference in kind what we're doing here as behavioral scientists versus as intuitive scientists, it's a difference in the in degree and mm. what you know how how we're assessing evidence. That's the only difference. We and I don't think I don't think behavioral science starts starts well if it's not connected to the world. Yeah, we we've interviewed people that we call accidental behavioral scientists. Exactly that that they are doing this. They're they're do all of these factors. They're understanding. They're trying to understand why people are doing what they're doing. They just don't have the language or the the research background, but they're applying all of these principles in in practice in a daily life kind of thing. With that, where is your research going? What what are the things that are uh, top of mind for you now moving forward over the next couple of years? What are the things that you want to explore and get a deeper insight into? 
So I'm in the midst of writing another book right now, which is sort of consuming <laughs> every thought, spare thought I have beyond trying to get our papers out. And what's the, and what's the book? Is it, can you give us a, a little overview of what this, this book is going to be about? Yeah, the book is about undersociality. Mm -hmm. It's about people not being quite social enough for their own well-being, why that happens, what the consequences of that is, I think, for our own experience and also, I think, for society as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the angst and disconnection we're seeing in the world today comes from people not really engaging with each other in a, in a deeper way, becoming really disconnected from each other in lots of ways. And that just creates ill health, not at, just at the individual level, but at the societal level as well. So that's what it, that's where my attention really is. And beyond that, we don't, you know, I, I can't see that far ahead. The great <laughs> thing I think about research is that it unfolds as you're doing it. I can tell you about the papers we're writing right now. We're trying to understand how individual level beliefs about each other can produce social norms, mm. you know, kind of social level effects. So why is it sometimes we get situations like a train car or a plane where people almost never talk to each other versus others like a party where everybody talks to each other? What? Why? It's not, these things don't show up everywhere. We think they're critically contingent on people's beliefs and expectations about others. And we're trying to track that. But you know, wh where the next epiphany for where this goes next, we don't know. I, where, where that you know, next that, woman in a red hat is, we, we're not, yeah, not quite no, sure. I don't huh? know. And absolutely. I, I just, I don't know. You know, you, you're, when you're in the midst of a project, you're often, or a series of projects, you're often thinking, what's the bigger thing to do? So, you know, we'd like to take some of this world work around the world in different cultures, different contexts, yep. you know, make it big, look at, I actually think that what varies a lot around the planet are not people's experiences of social engagement, but rather their expectations. Mm. And so that you can explain more open or closed cultures, not by differences in their actual sociality, but rather by differences in their beliefs. That's a very hard problem to study, um, but that's the next big thing I'd like to start tackling. I know other people are tackling different aspects of this kind of work. So my friend Liz Dunn, who's at the University of British Columbia, brilliant behavioral scientist, is trying to understand how to encourage people to be more social. Mm. Right. So how do we overcome these expectations to encourage more sociality? Those aren't problems I'm that well equipped to think about. Other people are better at thinking through those kinds of problems than I, I am. And so I don't necessarily see our work going that direction but then beyond that who knows you know who knows <laughs> we're you know we're, we're we're blind runners yeah here uh, where we can see kind of as far ahead as we can feel yeah. uh in front of us but long-term vision you know and, and any given experiment is is likely not to work out that is your hypotheses are likely to be off in some way and you're learning as you go along you don't know what you're going to learn which is the fun part about the research right i mean if everything absolutely rolled out like the hypothesis that you have then it would be like all right well yeah we're just making good guesses and that's not how this works absolutely yeah absolutely the key thing i am harping on my students about all the time and it's there's it's a subtlety of it's a subtlety of language that I try to drive out um, of my own thinking and out of my students as much as I can is is not to talk about experiments as showing that mm. we designed this experiment to show that or we would like to prove that or would like to demonstrate something our experiments we don't design our experiments to confirm our beliefs. Rather, I try to encourage my students and myself to always think of in terms of testing that. Yeah. We designed this experiment to test that hypothesis or to test whether, because the most interesting insights from research, I think, the things that really get you moving down a new path are the cases where you were not right, where your expectation led you astray. One great example of that in in our work was 
one recently where we were trying to understand how to overcome some of these misunderstandings about the minds of others. So I, it's hard to know uh, what others' beliefs and attitudes are. And one of the ways that psychologists, I think, had presumed for a long time would, would make us better at this was engaging in perspective taking. So, Tim, if I just put myself in your shoes, try to see things from your point of view, if I sit down next to you on the train or a plane, then I'll be better able to understand whether you want to engage with me or not, or I'll better understand your beliefs or attitudes. And we were, we started a bunch of, we started some experiments trying to understand, well, how does perspective taking like that increase accuracy? And it just turns out it doesn't. Mm. That is, putting myself in your shoes, Tim, doesn't do squat for me, <laughs> it turns out, in understanding, as well as far as I can tell, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't increase my ability to accurately understand what's oh. on your mind. It does a lot of other things to me, makes me feel closer to you and makes me think that you're more similar to me, but it doesn't necessarily give me access to your mind because I don't have access to your mind. <laughs> I'm just guessing in my own mind. So that project started with a hypothesis test that just turned out our, our expectations were just wrong. And we're wrong again and again and again and again and again and again and again. We published a paper with 25 experiments in it where we were reporting that engaging in perspective taking, putting myself in your shoes, doesn't increase the accuracy with which I predict your, your views, yeah. your beliefs, or your attitudes. And only one thing does, it turns out, which is the really – Stupid thing, a stupidly obvious thing of just asking you <laughs> what's on your mind. Wait, wait, that's wait, the headline. Yeah. Yes, no, she, no. I was yeah, about that, to swear. No, no kidding. This is no, yes, shit. no that's kidding. Okay. No, this is a no uh, shit moment. Yeah, this no is. kidding. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting about that paper was the, the obvious solution was the only one that increased accuracy, but people didn't recognize that. That is, they thought perspective taking would increase their their accuracy. They thought doing that would make them better. And when they were actually doing each of these things, when they were engaging in, you know, when we brought spouses in together to to put themselves in their partner's shoes to guess what was on their mind, they thought they were doing just as well using a completely ineffective strategy <laughs> as when they were actually asking their partner what they thought about these questions they were then later having to predict their responses on. So, yeah, so insight often comes, I think real insight comes not when we're doing experiments that show that, but when we're doing experiments that test weather. That's what we're trying to do. I'd like to switch things up a bit here. So forgive the lack of a clever segue, but I'm interested in talking about music for just a minute. And if you found yourself stuck on a desert island, let's say you're going to finish the book. You're going to you're going to separate yourself from the from the whole world, from your loving family and wonderful colleagues at, at in Chicago, and you're going to stay on a desert island for a year. What two musical artists would catalog would you would you take with you? Oh God. <laughs> Well, we talked about James Hetfield earlier, so I'd need Metallica's. I need Metallica's uplift at times. Yeah. Um, and then I would probably bring along this guy who, a piano player named David Tolk, T O L K, who I just, who I really like. He's kind of a new agey. Some, uh, well, he's he's not a new age is the wrong is the wrong term for this. He's just a, a pianist who. who I think plays beautiful, soothing, lovely music. My daughter takes her naps to David Tolk, mm. asks Alexa to play David Tolk. Um, and, you know, the thing about music is, of course, it moves us. Yeah. It creates emotion and then does different things for us when we need to get ourselves riled up. I'm going to get the wild boar on the desert island. I better, you know, listen to a little <laughs> master of puppets. And when I'm ready to... Take a nap. I better cue up David Toke's Amazing Grace and calm down a little bit. So that's what I do. I, there would apparently be no middle ground for me. <laughs> it's like either, either constantly or riled up. That. Like I'm, I'm or hunting boar totally or chill. I'm writing and <laughs> contemplating <laughs> life. Well, I, we are novelty seeking, right? So you know, of course, we would set yeah. it up that way. You might only get you, when you get to the desert island. It might only be just about hunting wild boars and yeah, you know, Metallica. Knows. But. Uh, do you like to listen to music while you work? I do. Yeah, I do. Not music with words, typically. It depends what I'm doing, of course. I can listen to music with words if I'm doing something that's more 
mechanistic, you know, analyzing data or something that where where the steps are, are pretty routinized. Um, but I will often have music playing that that doesn't have words, instrumental music, calming uh, music. So David Tolk, for instance, the guy who I, I just mentioned, Tolk. And I've, I've actually recently, what I was listening to before we started talking was um, I watched the the Channel 5 production, which is playing in the United States now on PBS, of All Creatures Great and Small, which is, if you haven't watched this television program, it's just the loveliest thing. Uh, just my wife and I watched it, and I'm obsessed with this. And they just had the loveliest the loveliest instrumental music to go on with with this just beautiful show that was about um, just a lot of these beautiful human relationships in this lovely, you know, UK countryside setting on these old farms. Gorgeous. And, and so I, I've been playing that in the background while I've been working. Cool. Very, very cool. Well, we want to express our gratitude to you for being a guest on Behavioral Groups today. Thank you so, so very much for taking your time and sharing your insights with us. We really appreciate it, Nick. Yeah, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me on here. This was really fun. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with Nick, have a free-flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our socially connected brains. <laughs> You're making it sound like there's something weird going on there. We have a – it's like the social – it's the un, – the, what's that Marvel, the the connected brain? I forget who – anyway, I don't know. Matter. I don't know, but uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit philosopher from the early 20th century, called it the nuosphere. Yeah. No, notice you go to early French philosophers, <laughs> and I'm talking Marvel. <laughs> Shows you where 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 we spend most of our time, right there. Just, it really is. It's pretty, and it, I can't even remember the Marvel thing where you can quote like nice and direct. That's that. There you go, folks. If you want to have a deep conversation, talk to Tim. If you want to just talk about, talk about comics, hey, you know who's better, Iron Man or Captain America? Come talk to me. There you go. All right, well, where do we where do we want to start this grooving session on on next? I have a question for you. Oh. Do, do you talk to people on airplanes? I like do. The strangers that are sitting next to you. I, I do, but not all the time. Okay. What what? Uh, and, well, why? Uh, well, and uh, the reason that I do is because I read Nick's paper. Okay. So a few years ago, and I, and I took it to heart, and so I don't do it all the time, and I, I absolutely didn't do it much before that. But I like it, I have to admit. But not on long flights. Like like we flew to Qatar, it was <laughs> yeah. 16 hours in yeah. the air. No, I, I was not interested in, in starting a conversation that might last that long. But like on hour-long flights or, you know, two-hour-long flights, yeah. I yeah. think that it's okay just to have a little bit of chit-chat and find out if they're getting divorced or not or <laughs> who's, who's, you know, if their grandmother is dying or, you know, you get these really weird interpersonal things. And I like it. And, and how about you? You know, it's really interesting because I don't. And I have this like little – Like not at all? I typically don't. So I, I, there have been a few times. And those few times have been absolutely wonderful. So it's this idea like, like you know, I've had great conversations – and I've never had a really horrible one. I've had one, I think, where uh, the person droned on a little bit. But, you know, I was able to weasel my way out of it. So it wasn't like <laughs> it, was, it was horrid. Yeah. But I just don't. I get my book. I get my headsets on. I kind of make it pretty, you know, noticeable. Like, don't talk to me <laughs> yeah. until we land and the wheels hit and we're getting the, the ding goes on. And I go, oh, and then you have that conversation. But man, yeah. Because you know you've only got like six minutes between yep, the and, and touchdown as, and the As and the horrible terminal. as that conversation can be, it's only going to last for a short time, <laughs> then, for sure. But but given this, I, I am I'm going to – because of this research and because of talking to, to, to Nick, I, I think I'm going to be more like you. I'm going to make a, an effort to say hi, to 
introduce myself and ask just some meaningful questions that might right. lead to a good conversation. I will tell you, I had one of the best conversations ever with this guy coming back from uh, on a red eye from Las Vegas. Huh. You know, I was young and, and you know, and we he's telling me about his, you know, how he goes out to Vegas and gambles on and he flies out over the weekend during football season because he bets on all of the all the sports things and how much he bets. And it's just an interesting conversation, you know, so you've have some really interesting conversations. Okay. But, you know. So it's, it's happened. It has happened. Yeah. But, and yet you still steered away from it until... Until just recently? Yeah, because, you know, I, I never trust my own intuition <laughs> and I just I, – I need research to back it up. So, yeah. no, I don't know. It's, it's – it's, it's, as I think one of the things that he said, right? I think even though I had the good experiences with this, I still had that fear. A, the fear that, A, I'm going to get stuck in a bad conversation. But, two, the fear that the person sitting next to me isn't going to want to have that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to want to be left alone. And so I'm bothering them by trying to initiate something. I don't know. I, I, I've, when I started doing this, I took it from the place of, you never know. And I'm just going to be uh, friendly and see what happens. And uh, again, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but I've met some really interesting people yeah, very, very interesting people, people who were wildly financially successful, wildly successful in their sort of their relationships, like they had great families, you know, to rely on um, and people who were troubled. You know, I wasn't joking about the, you know, I'm just getting divorced or holy cow, you know, my grandmother just died and I'm going to the funeral. It's like, get, you know, yeah. shit happens, you know, it's real life. But this is the piece that I. I, you know, the big piece that I'm taking out of this, and it goes back actually, um, you know, John Levy talked about the same thing, but this idea that, you know, the the well-being in life comes the quality of our connections. Yeah. John Levy said it in this way back in, I forget which episode he was in, but he said, the fundamental element that defines the quality of our lives is the people that we surround ourselves with and the conversations that we have with them. And what I love about what Nick is saying is – saying you have both those really tight and deep, meaningful relationships like we have with our families and our close friends, but there's also those weaker connections that make a difference in our lives. And particularly, this is the part that I think you know John Levy's talking about, is this the conversations that we have with them. And if we have better conversations with people and more of those better conversations, we have a much better life. And I'm just, uh, that's what I'm running with. Yeah. It is, th that's fantastic. I love that quote from John. Just kind of love John in general because he's such a, sh a sharp guy. But it is so interesting that Nick has picked up on this idea that even though we know it's better, we still don't do it. That, you know, that, that we know that we rely on other people, that we rely on relationships. And yet we still don't do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we talk to people at parties, but oftentimes because we have to, because yeah. it's the it's the it's the social norm. So like, oh, got to go to this party. I'm going to meet a whole bunch of new people. OK, put on my party face. And what happens at those parties when you, you start talking to those you people? You come away with, OK, that guy, I'll never talk to him again. But, oh, my gosh, this woman is doing some incredibly cool stuff. And oh my, I would have never guessed that she's a psychologist and she's doing research in this and that. It's like, wow, great conversation, you know. And you 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 leave typically being more pumped up than that, right? Yeah. When you have those conversations, yeah, right. If you go to a party and you don't talk to anybody, that's a pretty bad party, right? <laughs> yes. And why don't we think the same thing yeah. on a train ride or a plane ride? Why don't we think about this as I'm sitting around all these people yeah. who have interesting lives and are doing interesting things, and we could be sharing and and talking to each other and you know, I should be uh, disappointed when I land and I haven't talked to the people around me. I've taken this to, uh, into uh, Katie and I have tickets to the Guthrie, uh, a, a local theater in town. And when we sit down and if the, the people sitting adjacent to us are already there, just say hi. Yeah. You know? what, what brought you here? Are you a big fan of Shakespeare? Are you just a season ticket holder or, you know, uh, just start a little conversation. And even though there might only be five minutes, it's just nice to kind of smile at somebody and 
it, it just feels good. Yeah, it does. I mean, I think there's a lot of those opportunities that we have in line, you know, waiting at Starbucks, doing whatever it would be. Oh, yes. You can be yes. having those different conversations. We, uh, you know, skiing, uh, you, you ride up the chairlift oh, right. with people. Right. And, or, you or know, when you're waiting in line. Or waiting in line. You know, there's all of those things. At the basketball game, we were at the, ba- you know, like just like you at the Guthrie. You know, there's different people that, you know, sit around me by the Timberwolves game all the time. I know I have something in common with them. They are obviously basketball fans. Right. So right, right there, you can start up a conversation and those are much better better times when you have that conversation going than when you don't. Anyway. You're part of the same tribe. Yeah. It's not like you're just, you're part of the, I'm flying from Minneapolis to Chicago tribe. Yeah. You're part of a, we like sports and we like <laughs> basketball tribe. It's much more meaningful. The, the Minneapolis to Chicago tribe. I, I like that tribe. <laughs> Pretty weak. Pretty weak tribe. <laughs> so I, what I what I also <laughs> liked though was, was in the conversation that we had with Nick is, is he talking about you know, so why does this happen? And some of the research they did around that. And I, I love the, the way that he talked about that misalignment between reality and expectations. We expect people to, you know, that this won't be easy, that it's hard, that they're not going to want to talk to him. Well, so you're like to- a walking lab. You, this has been you, right? <laughs> it is. This is exactly me. Others don't want to talk, you know, all of those things. I think that that is um, great. So here's the thing. If you're listening to Tim and me talk right now, right? I, I encourage you to try this out. Hell yes. Just go out and and make an attempt whether it be at your local theater and the shopping, you know, mall and you're in line waiting, just say hi to somebody and try to start up a conversation because mm. that's what I loved uh, Nick's thing. If you're having a dialogue with yourself, should I do this or not? You should do it. That's it. That's exact. That That's the best question right there. Uh, and uh, don't be creepy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? well, I don't know if you can help but being creepy, well, Tim, but, but that's that's a but whole separate a, a, aside. But to follow that, it's good to start by just sharing first. Yeah. You know, you don't have to put somebody on the spot. Oh, man, I didn't think it was going to take so long to get through this line. Yeah. You know, I'm just buying, you know, six pairs of jeans, nine, you know, T-shirts and, you know, 18 pairs of socks. And they're getting heavy in my arms. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or I don't know. <laughs> You've given an insight into your buying habits here. <laughs> you like just go and buy all your clothes for the entire like five, five year years, period yeah, and, yes. and one, like, one, one time. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, and I think it, it comes down to though. I think the big piece that that kind of he brought up is that it comes down to mindset, right? Yeah. Being more open to these interactions, thinking of this as a party as opposed to a plane ride where you, you know, put your head into your book or and put your headphones on, right? You yeah. have, you open it up. What yeah. did he say? We're more like magnets than marbles. Oh, I love that. Quote. Love that yes. line. Yeah. We're more like magnets. So just let the magnets, you know, I, I, again, there's two poles, right? We're not always going to match up and we're not picking partners for life. It's just for the next minute and a half or six minutes. Is there, is there a conversation that we might have that could be enriching or yeah. not or not? And, and and either way, it's not not going to be as you said. You're not picking your your partner for the rest of your life. You're not going to be, you know, have a horrible experience that you're going to be, you know, miserable for no. days on end. It, no. It's a good conversation or not, and more likely than not, it will be a good conversation. Probably. And that I think is so. Go out there, take the initiative, be first to share, have a different mindset about it, and you know, you're going to be happier for it. Agreed. All right. So. I think that's a good place to wrap up. I think so. All right. All right. As always, as always, 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 thank you for listening. And please, please reach out to us on social media. We want to have those deeper and more meaningful conversations with you. Yes, you, the person who has your headphones on right now and you're listening to my voice. You, I'm talking to you. As I'm sitting across the table from you and you're looking at me and (laughs) and you keep saying this, it feels just a little bit impersonal. (laughs) Just saying that. Um, it is true, though. We do want to hear from you because <laughs> – You. I, we're talking to you. <laughs> well, we want to do it even more uh, and and more than we're doing it now, right? And As we do more of it, it's going to improve our well-being. It's going to improve our subjective experience. It's going to improve our psychological richness. And it's going to improve your 
well-being <sighs> listener. Not bad. There you go. Right. There there you that's go. right. Everybody benefits. Yeah. We're, we're just such giving people, Tim. <laughs> that's all we're doing. We're just giving, giving, giving. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we are. <laughs> I don't know. All right. If you don't reach out to us, which I can understand because we probably just freaked you out with this whole thing. Possibly. Two minutes possibly. Here. You got, those guys are freaks. No way am I connecting with them. Then at least start a conversation with someone when you're on your next plane flight or in line at Starbucks. It will make your life better. Science proves it. Bing. Yes. Uh, we truly appreciate you spending time with us. And we hope that you've learned something. Maybe there's something that Nick said that you can take with you. Like, we're more like magnets than marbles. And and that you can go out and use that today, tomorrow, this week. And, and hopefully you can go out and find your groove. 